Thank you, Ted. You can go ahead. Okay, everybody. Thank you so much for 53 people coming. Um, 53 plus four is, is 57, actually. Um, so today we are uh, at the uh, monthly program um, for Bay Kai, and um, this happens um, often uh, physically at park, but not for a bit. A bit. Um, and we've been having some very exciting meetings where we have speakers from uh, human computer interaction uh, generally come and present. Um, and um, often uh, we have a lot of new people coming. Um, and so I'd be interested in people raising their hands if this is their first uh, Kai, um, Abe Kai. Um, and it looks like we have. 10, 12, uh, 11 people that have never been to Bay Kai before. That's, that's kind of uh, great. Um, and, and what we uh, do is we have an organization which you can help. Uh, we have uh, volunteers we call uh, Bay Kai uh, Experience Creators. Um, and they do everything from helping record in the videos to putting on dinner for before the event. We had dinner. Uh, video this evening and we talked about uh, expression uh, on uh, YouTube. It wasn't what we planned. That's turned into a playful experience uh, talking about expression on, 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 um, on uh, Zoom. Um, and uh, um, as we uh, go forward, I just want you to know that you can also decide you want to get really involved. Like I, I'm involved so much that I'm helping uh, pick the speakers and we are looking for somebody else that wants to do that too because because Nancy Fishberg who has been doing it for many years wants to stop doing that. Smitha and I uh, and her work together on that. Um, we have meetings once a month on the first Tuesday of the month where we have the steering committee. Anybody can come and that's a meeting where we talk about who we are but mostly we talk about the business of running Bay Kai. It runs on your on your dues so thank you for joining if you if you if you decide to. Uh, but we do have these free uh, free um, programs, and we are hoping to put together, if somebody's interested, uh, a birds of a feather about um, about careers and getting jobs in in kind. So um, with that, I'm going to just say uh, just a couple words. Um, I know um, that in uh, two months, um, yeah, October, we're going to have a meeting where we have some. Some of the greats that were around in the in the 80s thinking about visual um, interface, uh, visual thinking, are going to be um, talking about the life and uh, work of uh, Fred Lakin. Um, and that's going to be Larry Leifer, the professor at Stanford, uh, Robinette, who made one of the first uh, Rocky's Boots uh, educational uh, game, um, uh, <clears throat> Scott Kim, who uh, is is famous for um, things that you can turn upside down and still look the same. And he's written a few books about, about visual representation. And, and, um, and Henry Lieberman, um, who, uh, well, he did all sorts of things. I invented the way that um, you, you pour, when you pour something into a, a paint program and it fills it all up, that, that, that paint, uh, that, that's, that's an example of his invention. So next month, I think that um, Nancy and Smitha are thinking about, uh, maybe it will happen, maybe we'll do something else, about uh, something about careers. Um, tonight, we have Barbara Tversky. And Barbara, I've known for longer than I actually know. Uh, I remember when I first came to Stanford and she was thinking about visual language. Um, and I was very excited about that at the time. Uh, so maybe she remembers Fred Lakin um, too. Um, and maybe you want to talk about him even. Be, he's a pretty exciting, wouldn't you say, Barbara? He's a pretty exciting guy. And yeah. Scott Kim, I also know. Yeah. yeah, and another very exciting person, right? Hi. Yeah. So, so, um, so anyway, uh, Barbara is an exciting person. Uh, she's had an amazing life. Uh, doing um, research in psychology in various fields that are kind of, that are, that are always somewhat adjacent to user interface in my view. I don't know what she'll think about that, but she's got this fantastic book in my view. I heard her talk about it recently and I, I just thought we'd uh, really uh, possibly enjoy, enjoy having her come and visit with us. So I, I don't really wanna say uh, 
much more. She's at um, Teachers College at, uh, at um, Columbia a lot of the time, and she's been a professor at Stanford and many other, many other things have happened to her. Um, but uh, you can read about her bio, go online and find lots about her. Okay, Barbara, would you like to take it away? Sure, thank you and thank you for the very kind introduction. Um, I should say I have too much to tell you. <laughs> I'm gonna end up having to skip. Okay. But we will have questions at the end. Okay, good. I'm sorry I can't see you and answer questions during the talk, but I don't, I hardly see anybody. So all creatures must um, move and act in space in order to survive. Oops, my cursor is not working. Here. Another example. Even babies and even plants must move and act in space to survive. And the contention of this book that Ted kindly referred to is that all thought begins as spatial thought. Um, even the cover of the book, some people see um, a constellation or a network. Some people see a man running and it's a forest trees sort of experiment. So spatial thinking is the foundation of thought, not the entire edifice, but the foundation. What I mean by spatial thought is moving in space and interacting with the things in space. So space is special, it's supramodal. It isn't just vision. We know about space from hearing, from touch, from all the modalities that we have and they get integrated in some way, or at least partially integrated in, in the side of your brain, parietal lobe. Um, spatial thinking is essential for survival. If we couldn't find our ways to shelter, couldn't get food in our mouths, we'd essentially be dependent on others forever. It's the basis for other knowledge, and I'll talk at length about that, on how we use spatial thinking to think about just about everything. It's not like geometry or physical measurement. It's constructed. It, it, it's distorted in ways that geometry and physical measurement are. In fact, there, the systematic distortions in our conceptions of space are a consequence both of perception and of action, and those two are linked. So again, actions in the world form the foundation of thought. The same brain structures that represent places in spatial relations also represent events, people, and ideas in temporal, social, and conceptual relations. So work that won the Nobel Prize in, in 2014 by John O'Keefe and the Mosher's working in his lab was a, a conjunction of work that had been going on many years in O'Keefe's lab. O'Keefe and his collaborators had found single cells in hippocampus that fire when the rat is in a particular place. And these single cells bring together information from all over, over the cortex, information about touch, about smell, about sight, multimodal information into a single cell that fires when a rat is in particular places. It, this was work that was done in the 70s and, and much later, but the, the single cells indicated in red there by firing weren't spatially arrayed. What the Mosers did in his lab was to find one synapse away grid cells that arrayed the places in, in a spatial array. And the newspapers went wild calling it a GPS set, uh, um, system. It isn't. And in fact, interestingly, more recent work has found that it too is distorted where there are rewards, for instance. So it's not um, a, an, a completely accurate representation of the space outdoors. New work on human beings, and this is work from 2017 on, on human beings looking at single cells has found that um, the grid cells also, it also array temporal information, conceptual information, 
and social information. So it, the grid cells are capturing space, they're capturing time, they're capturing concepts, they're cap capturing social relations, place cells do. So this is strong evidence that spatial thinking is the foundation of all thought. I'm way oversimplifying the brain, but um, my hippocampus people didn't get alarmed when I described this this way. In fact, I came up with an analogy that the hippocampus makes checkers for ideas or people or, or places, and the grid cells um, map them on a checkerboard, map the relations among them. So we use action in space, people do, not rats, I think, but um, we use it to think and to communicate. And I'll illustrate some ways of, of that that happens throughout the talk. And in fact, you can think of thinking, or one view of thinking is that it's communicating with yourself. And so talking out loud is okay. Um, so what's thinking? A one of the old thinking is that it's representing perception and action in the mind where they can be worked on. But thought can quickly overwhelm the mind. And when thought overwhelms the mind, the mind puts thought into the world. And the mind can put thought into the world in graphics, in gestures, in words, and in other ways as well. But these are the three primary ones. I'll talk mostly about graphics and gesture because they're a very natural, immediate, a way of communicating and words are bear arbitrary relations to their meaning, whereas graphics and gestures don't. So where are the words? Um, a great deal of intelligence goes into playing basketball. Most of it's nonverbal. And it's really quite amazing how players are keeping track of each other and how, where they're moving, anticipating where people are moving faking so the opponents won't realize where you're going to throw the ball. It's an enormous amount of intelligence and it's not verbal. So I want to show you now some people thinking and these are experiments from our lab um, and we put people alone in a room and have them remember descriptions. They would be tested on it. The descriptions are hard to remember. It's only part of one here and um, we, they were allowed to read it four times. So they're alone in a room and there's a camera and I'll show, I first read a bit of what um, our participants were reading and then I'll show you what they were doing as they were reading. So Etna is a charming town nestled in an attractive valley, entered on River Highway. River Highway runs east-west at the southern border, southern edge of the town of Etna. Toward the eastern border, River Highway intersects with Mountain Road, which runs north of it, etc. So the, the, the descriptions placed either four or eight landmarks. These are descriptions we've used in various forms in studying various aspects of spatial thinking. So you have an idea now of the spatial description. And here is somebody reading. Watch. By watching him, he thinks he was something like normal. Nobody told him to do that. Nobody told him to get there a lot. But she's making lines for the cameras. She's making dots up there for the cameras. This is something to say about her. Next. When, she's, when they did it, they um, performed better on the test. And we took another group, and, or we ran it again, where one group was free to do what they wanted, just as she was. The other group was instructed to sit on their hands. Those instructed to sit on their hands performed much worse, OK? So this is an effect that we've replicated many times. and, and um, we've done variations, so this is another 
set of representative of another set of stimuli. We ask people to re read about mechanical systems. And again, they were tested. So this is a car brake. From the brake fluid reservoir, brake fluid, I can't read, enters and travels sideways down the, the tube. As the brake fluid accumulates at the bottom of the tube, pressure is exerted on the small pistons inside the wheel cylinders. This causes the pistons to push outward toward the brake drum. It's hard for me to read it without gesturing, but I did it and we'll look at a gentleman who's reading this and watch again. He's, uh, um, So he's repeating with another gesture what he just did. And you see his eyes are on the screen. He's not looking at his hands. This is, that's not a gesture. This is typical that they're studying the screen and not looking at their hands. Sometimes the next woman you'll see um, does look at her hands. But when you watch this, you really get the feeling that somebody's thinking. You're watching someone thinking. and. One observation I made in the book and many in, in it holds for many places is that we do wear our insides on our outsides. So I need my cursor, yes. Um, this is another woman, she's reading about a schedule or it's a company that's running events and they have three events at the same time and there are four time slots in it, and she's having to learn what fits in each time slot. Oops, this one, let me see, wait, yeah, it's gonna work. She is a bit looking at her hands. Not everybody is that emphatic. Um, some people use the back of their hand, um, they use the joints to make a matrix. Some people make it a matrix on the palm of their hand. Some make a matrix on the desk. So people are doing the gestures people make are, are I think quite different. But in every case, what we count is gesturing is somebody modeling the situation they're reading about. So the gestures model the situation described in the text. The models are spatial motor, not visual, and preventing gesture reduces comprehension. And we get the feeling watching those people that the gesture is translating the language into thought. The language is hard, you saw that, and you only read part of the descriptions. And it feels like the gestures are making this model of what they're reading and that allows them to think about it or consolidate it in their minds. So what about gestures for others? We've, we've done th this experiment that I just described, we've done many times with many variations, including variations where people actually looked at a diagram and even there they gesture to understand the diagram in the same ways that people gesture when they're reading descriptions. But what about gestures for others? So many people have done work showing that gesturing, my gestures help you think. Well, this is why Zoom is, one reason why Zoom is so, um, it, it, is so frustrating. Um, so, and we've done one, I'm in an ed school now, so we're, we're interested in educational material. And in this study, students watched a video explanation of a car engine with one of two kinds of gestures. So half saw action gestures, the carburetor goes up and down and so forth. Half of them saw structure gestures that just showed the shape of, the, of various parts of the engine. We didn't think the structure gestures would have much of an effect because people get structure easily. It's action that's hard for people, especially people with, who are low spatial and low spatial people, half Stanford students are low spatial. So you can be really smart and be low spatial. Um, but um, 
understanding action from diagrams or gesture is harder for low spatials. They get it easily from text. So this is another set of studies. So half saw action, we thought action would have an effect because we know action is hard and gestures are actions. After seeing the videos four times, they had a true false test of structure, uh, of questions of, about structure and action, but then they made visual explanations of the engine, essentially elaborated diagrams, and they also made videoed explanations of the engine. So on the true false test, those that saw action gestures did better on the true false test. As for the visual explanations, I'll show you some now. They're quite remarkable. Um, this is somebody who saw structure gestures. That's their visual explanation. Another person who saw action, structure gestures, their visual explanation. This is someone who saw action gestures. You see way more action. They get the five stages better. They use arrows way more and they show the bubbles when the gas and the oxygen mix and they show the explosion. So they didn't see and they saw gestures, but they, they, they internalize the action so that they were able to express it better in these visual explanations. Here's another one. So it, and then with the video, I don't think I have a slide there, I don't. The videoed explanations, the people who saw action gestures used more gestures, both for action and for structure. Their gestures on the whole were invented. They weren't imitations of what they saw and they used more action words. They didn't hear more action words. The, the verbal script was the same. So all their understanding of action came from the gestures. The gestures are really powerful in explaining and teaching, especially for difficult material. So it, gestures are also important in collaborations. This is an old study. It was pairs of strangers brought into the lab and asked to find a route for rescuing Stanford students after an earthquake. They got a map showing what roads were blocked off and where wounded were gathered and how many. So they worked at getting a route. One group was like this. They worked side by side. They could see each other. The other group simply had a shower curtain between them. So they had separate maps, same ones, and they, they had to verbally agree on a route. For those people that had the shower curtain, 30% of their maps were different. They thought they had agreed on a route, but they hadn't. And it's because spatial language is, is quite ambiguous and the, the gestures, um, sorry, I, the gestures disambiguate. You can see here, they're, they're mostly, yeah, it's they're not really what if we can, yeah, come down like this? Yeah. Or would it be faster if we're this way? Because the sound is irrelevant. But you see, all the action is in the gestures. And as I say, their maps were much better. They're much happier with the collaboration when they can see in gestures. And I think, it, again, another problem with Zoom, especially for working meetings, is you don't have a common whiteboard or a common table that you can arrange and rearrange tokens or draw on and point to where everybody is. In this case, that map was public. We could all, both people could see it and work on it. This is much harder to do in Zoom. Okay, so both gestures and graphics, and these are two of, or three or four of many, 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 many studies. Both gesture and graphics can enhance comprehension and learning, both for self and for others. We've done studies where people make diagrams, make video, uh, um, visual explanations of things and they learn much better than if they make a verbal explanation. 
Graphics are in, can be viewed as frozen gestures, and they have the advantage that they stay there and they can be scrutinized and altered. Gestures are fleeting. They don't need any tools other than the ones you're born with. Um, and they're especially good at representing action. Okay, I'm going to say briefly some of the other topics that I, I present in the book. Of course, I can't have videos of gestures in the book, um, but I could show them to you. So I'm glad about that. Um, we, we act in many spaces and we create many spaces by our actions and for our actions. And we turn in our thinking actions on objects into actions on thought. So, and I'll come back to that. The spaces we've studied are space of the body and we've found again on distortions that the function of different parts of the body is more important than the size. So that again goes against any kind of Euclidean measurement. A uh, number of experiments on that. We studied the space around the body in particular, how do we keep track of the things around us as we move? And we do that through a mental representation or mental scaffolding on the axes of our body. And it's also affected by gravity. That's our frame of reference. So it's again distorted by um, gravity and that asymmetry of the axes. So retrieving things that head and feet is faster than left and right, because head and feet have the advantage of gravity when you're upright and uh, uh, body asymmetry, but left and right are pretty much symmetric. So I won't be able to tell you more than that about it. Space of exploration we've looked at, both from, and what's one thing that's remarkable about that is that our experience is within an environment and we create mental representations as if from above. So maps go way back in history and we seem to do that quite readily, even small children. Um, we've also found systematic distortions in our memory for maps, um, and I can't go through all of those now, um, but people remember um, distances to landmarks are smaller than distances from landmarks. Perspective matters are a whole set of things that distort our mental representations of space. So we say it's not so much a cognitive map, but a cognitive collage because we know about those spaces from maps, from exploring, from people describing things. From, so we have to put all of that together like a collage. We've also looked at the spaces we create in the mind, in gesture, on a page, in the world, and in the words. Um, so spaces we create. Um, here are spaces that we create on a page, diagrams and sketches and maps and Family trees are some of them. And um, as far as language goes, our minds go from thought to thought, the way our feet go from place to place, and they create networks. And again, we talk about actions on thought, the way our hands act on objects. So language is full of metaphoric spaces, like Coffin Johnson picked up some of this, but so did have many others. We can say we're out of depth at the top of the class, feeling up, falling in depression. We've grown closer. Um, we think out of the box. And many of these expressions that are spatial get um, enunciated with gestures. We can raise ideas. We can pull them together, tear them apart, turn them upside down, push them forward, toss them out. And again, these expressions get um, turned into gestures too. So we put the, the first part of the book that I wrote is about putting the world in the mind and the second part is putting the mind in the world and I've shown you some of those ways. We put the mind in the world to enhance our physical lives but what's of more interest to me is they putting our mind in the world enhances our cognitive lives. I think this is probably uniquely human it's, we've never seen a gorilla making a map, 
they do gesture, but most of their gestures are for um, grooming or sex. Um, so putting the mind in the world creates cognitive tools. I'm one of many people in, um, who's been studying them. They can inform and educate. They can augment memory and information processing by alleviating limited working memory. They can use space to represent little and, literal and metaphoric space and action. They promote inference and discovery. It's right there where you can see it, not holding it in your mind. You see new things in it. They allow creation, revision, and inference by a community because they're public. So they're, and again, I argue that they're uniquely human, but I'd love it if somebody would show, bring evidence to the contrary. So in many ways, these cognitive tools, putting our mind in the world, are the earliest evidence of symbolic thought. We don't know when humans or pre-humans or Neanderthals or whatever started speaking. But we do know that cave paintings and petroglyphs go back probably 70,000 years, if not more. So this is the former oldest map. It was found in Babylonia. It's clay, which is probably why it survived. It's showing you two perspectives from above and from within. So mixing perspectives, linguists don't like, psychologists don't like, geographers don't like, but people do fine with it. Um, this is the current oldest map. Um, it was found in a cave in Spain. It goes back 13,000 years. It's about one inch by two inch by one inch. So it's small, you could put it in a pocket. And to the archeologist's delight, that stone depicts the environment outside the cave. And apparently there are some horned creatures there and mountains and maybe a river, a valley and so forth, all there inscribed. So it was portable, you could carry it with you. Um, maps come in all kinds of varieties. This is an Eskimo coastal map. It's enlarged, they're carved from wood. They fit in a, ma a mitten so that um, you can keep your hand covered and you, you explore it tactily. And it's showing the indentations of the coastline. If it falls into the water, it floats. Um, another kind of floating map for seafarers, the South Sea Islanders apparently use these. They sailed uh, 2,000 miles in the open ocean, and at least some of them came back. So they, the shells are islands. They're too far to be seen, one from another. And the bamboo sticks are the ocean currents. You can think of them as the highways of the ocean. So you had to be highly skilled to use these, and you use them in conjunction with what the sea looks like. And so you can detect the currents, and you use it in conjunction with the stars. Um, this is petroglyphs in Italy. There's a whole valley of them in Bedolina, and they go back um, 4,000 years. And again, they're showing you two perspectives. Some North Coast Indian Native American maps, they used a hand. And anyone from Michigan will hold up a hand, and I should do it this way for you, and show you where they live in Michigan. Um, so that, that, that was space. We also have ancient representations of time or events, such as hunts, which we find in many caves in southern France and, and Spain. Um, on petroglyphs, this is from a, a place in Utah that's uh, got tons of petroglyphs. I've never been there, but I've seen photos. And again, we have a stampede that looked a little more primitive, but um, petroglyphs are hard to carve. Um, and this is recording a specific event. So on the left, it's, you see the, pe the petroglyph. On the right is a drawing of it. It goes back 6,000 years. An Indian astronomer saw it. Why are there two suns in the sky? And he um, went back and found out there was a supernova at that day. So it was a striking enough event that somebody recorded it in stone. 
um, making bread, again, events in time. This is explaining how to make bread. It's in a tomb. Um, what you can do with bread making in a tomb, I'm not sure. Um, I, again, time, calendars go way back, some circular, some tabular, tallies. And these are, the, are carved in stone going back seven, from South Africa, 70 to 1,000 years. It's not exactly clear what they're representing, and most tallies are single lines the way we make them today. This may be a more complicated counting system. Here is another African example on bones. Um, and they go way back, I'm skipping that. Another way to count, um, the Peruvian people were apparently used for accounting. It's, they're still a bit mysterious, the knots on the ropes, but one view is that they were used for accounting. Abacus, so ancient graphics, all over the world show people, animals, things that are important to people's lives. They show place and space. They show time and events. And they show quite primitively, there weren't necessarily good counting systems. They show number. And modern graphics, the same. And the brain, in fact, takes special notes of people, animals, and things, that quite literally, there are places in the brain that are sensitive to it. Place and space, certainly, I've shown you one place, but there are others. Time and events and number get a little more complicated, but they again are, are widely represented in the brain and, and independent of culture, as we've seen. Um, Okay, this is probably the first diagram, real diagram. It goes back to Diderot during, um, in the late 18th century. Diderot was teaching people what a diagram was. There were some 3,000 plates like this in his encyclopedia, which took him some 10, 15 years and many stays in prison during the revolution to create. But at the top is a scene in a typical factory at the time with natural lighting, people using implements, or it's unfortunately children using implements the way they would be using them. Everything is proportional to real world size. So this would have been familiar to 18th century audiences. What wouldn't be familiar is the bottom part, and it's separated by a box. And you can see there that the, the implements are, are displayed. They're not in correct size. They're in a size that enables you to see them. So the small ones are relatively larger. Um, the shading is to show you the details, not the natural shading. Um, they're lined up in columns and rows, which is again not, it's natural to our eyes, but it wouldn't have been natural to their eyes. And it's annotated with words and numbers and so forth. Again, these are features of diagrams now. And um, what's quite remarkable to me is that Diderot was teaching what a diagram was in the diagram. Again, a wordless way of teaching. More old, more modern graphics. Why they suddenly appeared in the late 18th century is somewhat baffling, but it might have to do with the presence and availability of paper. Um, this one you've probably all seen, the most poignant um, graphic of all times, Napoleon's unsuccessful campaign on Russia. I won't go through it now because I think you've seen it. Many other ways of graphically conveying information. I like these. I'm into comics altogether. Um, not so much the content, but the structure and, um, and the visuals, how the diagrammatic features. I have a whole other talk on that. But here you see uh, the artist is getting space and time at the, in the same way. The space is the background for all the temporal um, events that unfold as they usually do in, in the boxes, the left to right. This is Larry Gonick. You ought to get him to come at some point. He lives in, the, well, proximity doesn't matter anymore, but um, he, he does beautiful cartoon guides to statistics, math, calculus, genetics, 
um, wonderful guides, cheap, used in classrooms. And he comes up with wonderful visual analogies and he develops diagrams first from the more realistic here and they gradually get more abstract. Um, Harold and the Perfect, Purple Crayon, which small children can understand. Uh, Steinberg, um, this is familiar to most of you, the London tube map, which served as a, a paradigm for every underground uh, system in the world. So good graphic schematizes, that one does. They eliminate irrelevant information. They capture and exaggerate the essentials. So the tube lines don't run parallel, perpendicular, and diagonal. But it, for the purpose of transport, of understanding the system and navigating the system, that will do just fine. The distances aren't, aren't um, accurate. Um, the central London is much bigger. This is Heathrow down here, and it takes about an hour or 45 minutes to get here, and the rest of the time is quite fast. But again, the distance isn't that critical here. You want to know where you change trains and which trains go where. So um, the good graphics are, may show multiple perspectives. This one doesn't, but we've seen ones that do. And they're multimodal. They're annotated in one, one way or another, but usually not with sense. It's the word use and symbol use is quite truncated. So tools of visual communication. Um, they, I'm going to argue that they use spatial relations and marks and elements that convey meaning quite directly within a context. Again, unlike language. Um, so spatial relations, proximity in space signifies proximity on an abstract dimension. Centrality, central things are in focus. Directionality, the vertical is loaded. Up is more, better, stronger, more powerful. Horizontal on the whole is neutral, but there are cultural effects there that are quite strong. It's again, another talk and an interesting one. Um, and again, there are parallels in language and gestures. So centrality, we had people make the social networks and bear it the, in the middle. Many of them put the previous generation above them and the current generation on their level. Um, it, it, this, we collected diagrams from science and engineering texts. And for the most part, um, up is good. And at the top of all the evolutionary trees that we could find is man. And yes, it's always man. And um, because we're at the pinnacle, way at the top, geographic ages go that way, geological ages go that way too. The exception is family trees and language trees, where the prototypical example or the prototype language is at the top. The, the great um, ancestor is at the top and the descendants go down. So there are, two, there are two dimensions that are fighting each other, kind of prominence or origin and um, time, and the prominence or origin wins and goes to the top. Um, horizontal, I'm gonna skip. As I said, it's another talk. I'm gonna skip, oh, this is, sort of interesting. Somebody looked at, at soccer um, at, at soccer games and motion is, is perceived to be faster, more forceful if it goes from in reading order from left to right. And more fouls are in, in, in um, people who read languages left to right, more fouls are called when the, the, run, the movement is against reading order than with. And nobody's tried this yet as far as I know, in an Arabic or Urdu or Hebrew speaking country, but it needs to be tried. Um, jokes, well, okay. So I'm gonna skip the jokes, nothing is left, nothing is right. Elements can be iconic, metaphoric, or schematic. It's the schematic ones that interest me. Points on the whole, as you saw in root maps, they indicate places or ideas. In, in networks, lines are relations. 
um, arrows indicate an asymmetric relation and circles and boxes and so forth tend to be containers or sets or regions. Again, they depend on context for clarification, but those are the core meanings. And you can see some of these are akin to verbal spatial um, statements. So is a relation mathematical or romantic? Um, it, the context determines what it is. Um, so we've done a lot of research looking at how, the meanings of these schematic elements, lines and boxes and graphs, dots, lines and curves and root maps, arrows and mechanical system, circles in cycles. It's a kind of empirical semantics. And what the experiments typically do is show you a graphic and ask you to interpret it. And if we find consistency, such as lines show relations and graphs and um, boxes, which would be bars, show discrete relations, not um, functional relations. And then you do the opposite. You give verbal statements and ask people to make a graphic. And if they coincide, then you know you've gotten something that is a shared meaning. And we've done that in a number of cases. So I'm not going to, I'm going to skip through some. But when we ask people to just show people either a bar graph or a line graph and ask them to describe in a sentence what it is, people gave us discrete comparisons for the bars because the, the bar graph says there are a bunch of A's and a bunch of B's and they're separate. What the line graph does is say there are A's and B's and they share a dimension but have different values on the dimension. So we've run that in all kinds of instantiations. And if people even say things like, if you show the height of, of, of men and women, they say as you get more male, you, if you show it as a line, as you get more male, you get taller. So people, people's um, interpretations depend very much on the, the visual display. Um, um, I'm going to skip the root maps, even though um, they led to very nice work by, um, by Agrawal and Stoltig making, um, making schematic maps. And it's work that probably is quite familiar to, to the community. So I'm skipping it, not because I don't love the work, I do, but because I think you'll know it. Arrows have an, a natural interpretation of directionality. Arrowheads fly in the direction that they're pointing and riverbeds, the erosion goes in, in, in the direction of the arrow. We point, babies point very early, even, um, even big primates point. They don't follow each other's points, but they point. Um, arrows have many uses and interpretations. Julie Heiser and I looked at arrows for mechanical systems. So we presented people with one of these diagrams, either with arrows or without arrows. You're seeing the ones with arrows, car, brake, bike, pump, pulley system. But we also saw without arrows. When we gave people diagrams with arrows, they gave us functional or causal descriptions from beginning to end. When we gave people diagrams without arrows, they described the structure. So that simple arrow changes the meaning from structure of a diagram to its causal, the causal relations there. And we found something similar with descriptions so when we gave people structural descriptions, they made diagrams like the one on the left. They're showing us the parts in their spatial relations and labeling them. When we gave functional descriptions, they don't even bother to label the parts, but they show you, they use arrows that show you the action. So a simple arrow changes meaning. The trouble is they have tons of meanings. Bob Horn, who you may know from this community, came up with 107. I think probably eight, nine, 10 is enough. Um, but you see, and here in World War II diagrams, they're quite simple and understandable. The width of the arrow is the um, 
is the number of troops, the color is what um, army they belong to, the arrows go and the, the troops move in the direction of the arrows, but you can get arrows that are quite complicated and it's a problem in science texts because it's graphic artists that do them. And here you have three arrows with three different meanings and they're not disambiguated. And it happens all over, beautiful rock cycle in the arrows, even to geologists, they say, oh, it's beautiful. And I say, okay, what does this arrow mean? What does this arrow mean? And they say, uh-oh. So um, this is how to get your around in, in Venice. And it really doesn't matter which way you go. You're going to end up in San Marco. Um, this is how to pass a bill in Congress. You go around in circles. OK, so I, lines have many meanings. This is, again, a Steinberg, where the line keeps changing meaning. It's Steinberg's drawing. It's the Grand Canal. It's the road for, it's a clothesline, it's a road from above, but the context tells you what it is. So messy lines, clean lines, straight lines, organized lines are good for making clear diagrams. Messy lines are good for thought. This is Gary. Um, we studied architects who make messy sketches at the beginning, and they say they get new ideas from looking at the sketches. They see things they didn't intend in the sketches and keeping them ambiguous and vague allows that reinterpretation. So artists say the same thing. One of my graduate students was studying artists, um, a, lo a longer, very interesting story. They talk about um, a conversation between the eye and the hand and the page. If they talk, it interferes. They can't do it, they can't draw. Um, but it's, again, an intelligent activity and beautiful activity, but no language or very little. Um, they say ideas emerge from the page. They, again, interact with their sketches. So this you've seen. It's Snow figured out how to stop a cholera um, epidemic by plotting the cases on a map. This is still done today for epidemics, pandemics, which we're suffering from. Um, uh, I'm skipping these and I'm getting toward the end, but we do use um, diagrams to make deep, deep and important inferences. So this is the world as nature gives us, and this is the world we design. We do, there are many ways we design the world. One is themes. We put stuff that goes together in the same room. So things that come from many different categories but are used together, I call a theme and they are put in the same room. In contrast to a grocery store where you put like things together and arrange things hierarchically and categorically the way we do our kitchens and bookshelves bookshelves may even have linear orders. So we, these are categories in our mind and we put, use them in the world to organize the world. Um, another one of how category, we've got fruit and vegetables in different places, kinds of apples in the second row. Um, we use lines, rows, columns, boxes, and orders in 3D in our cities. Um, lines for temporal organization, and it goes left to right in the United States, and the Japanese assembly line is going right to left. Um, we have in our table settings, it's going to sound like a computer program, one-to-one -one correspondences, repetitions, cycles, embeddings. We get them in buildings. Um, this is from Padua. We, and then we use those organizations deliberately. Those organizations on the street sort of unintentionally communicate to us. We know what, we know a lot of characteristics about the building. We know how to shop in supermarkets where we can't read um, because they're organized in the same way. Um, so I can shop in Japan or Korea or China just as you can uh, without knowing the language. Um, then we deliberately use those organizations, rows and columns and boxes, to communicate, to create diagrams. This is one of the most effective, and we all spend hours with it as teenagers, 
train schedules similar. Um, this is the likelihood of a computer issue being solved by reconfiguring something, reimagining antivirus software, uninstalling programs, other jargon, or turning it on and off. And this is how long it took me to color each of these bars. So I coined a term, not a very pretty one, called spraction. It's a contraction of space, action, and abstraction. And it more or less says actions in space create abstractions. You saw them, our rows and columns in, and, and repetitions and embeddings in the buildings and in our organization of our homes. So those are abstractions. They're created by our actions in space. Those actions get truncated and turned into gestures, raising ideas, tossing them out, growing thoughts together. They get turned into gestures that again, communicate thought or help our thinking and thinking of others. And the patterns of those actions in space get turned into diagrams. So it's a kind of cycle of going, of creating things in space that are abstraction by our actions and using them as gestures and diagrams. So we not only put our minds in the world and design the world, we diagram the world. So the world is now a diagram, the world that we get around for the most part. This is airplane, uh, uh, an airport, remember those airports? Um, that the, as it is, is seen from above and you can see there are places where planes go and supply cars and buses and you better stay in your lane and stop when you're directed. But uh, airports are totally diagrammed, but even our streets are, um, are diagram where cars can go, where buses can go, when you stop, where you can park, where bikes can go, where people can go. It's all there diagrammed and regimented. So it, it enables action, but it also constrains and organizes our action in space. So I am done. And these are some of the granting agencies and I've neglected to, um, to name most of my collaborators and I apologize, but there's a long list of people that have been really helpful and insightful on any of these projects. So I don't know if there's time for question or if oh, yes. I can oh, yes, there are. hear your yeah. questions. I only see uh, two no, faces there's, there's, and There's two a couple of names. questions and I can put so them- uh, over to you, you call the shots. Well, it's okay. Um, I'm going to uh, let a couple of these people ask questions, but I'm gonna start by um, okay. my tips. Can you hear me? I'm not hearing anyone. Oh, I should be hearable now. And I'm going to stop sharing. Okay. So, I'm, yeah. I'm gonna, um, I so, there, so there I, you are. I'm not hearing anyone. Um, I'm sorry. I think other I people can. can hear me. Oh, shoot. Yes, I can hear you, okay. uh, Ted. I okay. can't hear. <laughs> oh, Barbara, uh, maybe there's something wrong with the way you're set up, I don't know. But there's a person named, um, uh, there, there's some questions at the bottom. Um, let's see, to uh, uh, check. As, uh, Ted, I can't hear. To, okay, okay. Q. Her um, audio might be turned off for Barbara, so maybe he's place it in chat. I can't hear. I Can can't I do hear. that, Barbara? Oh, I know what I did. I muted. Okay. <laughs> okay. I muted can, can we... Sorry, now I can hear. Fantastic. So there's two questions. Well, first thing I'm going to start off with just is there's, you know, as user interface professionals, we are all thinking really hard about, gosh, um, making things, making things uh, closer when you're going towards them and farther when you're going away. It's almost a Doppler thing that's going on in our heads. And we're just trying to think of design implications of these things. And, and it's almost like you, you walk right up to design implications. And I think, I think it's very interesting how um, the question of what do you think about the, 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 the difference between studying to understand phenomenon and studying to build things. That's just something I've heard you say a few things about sometimes. 
What do you mean studying? Studying. Studying things to build things. I'm an engineer. I study things to, to improve my quiver of design tools. You, you study things to make theories about, design, about the, the, the brain, I think. Right. So our daily activities are quite different. But um, I think it's incumbent on researchers who are researching the human mind or human behavior to think about the usefulness of it. I mean, what good is our research? Um, how can it help humanity in some way or another? It's, and so I think that's driven a great deal of my research. I've, I've drawn on issues that we all face, like wayfinding or assembling furniture, putting something together, and tried to look at that. Now, whether it helps your interfaces, I think it probably does. I've worked with enough people in HCI that, and I have the pleasure of working with enough people in HCI that uh, I think um, that, that, that our view of the human mind and human action can help a little bit. I'm, I'm always impressed with engineers. I really love working with them because they learn things from many different fields. They have to be broad in, in order to create something. And so both things, that you're open to learning things from fields that you don't know anything about, that's adventuresome and admirable, and that you make something that's useful. I, I, don't, I don't make anything that's very useful. So I, I'm always happy with engineers. Yeah. Uh, you do make you make things that are useful. Vidya, I don't know if I know how to pronounce your name. Can you speak uh, your your question, please? I, I unmuted you. Hi, uh, Barbara. This is Vidya Settler. I work at Tableau. Um, yeah. I I really enjoyed your talk. Um, I, I just have a general question about um, generative designs. I I see. So I I mean I work a lot with. Um, visual representation of data. And there's definitely um, a movement to uh, coming up with charts that not only um, represent the semantics of the data, but can be used for presentation. And uh, what I've noticed in that literature um, are a lot of systems that uh, produce generative glyphs. Um, rather than the typical standard bar charts and line charts, they're pretty aesthetically, um, but I often struggle um, in terms of tying um, the design and the visual output to the underlying data semantics. So I was wondering uh, whether you could talk about representation and cognition and how interconnected they should be and how much play and freedom um, can we think about when we're designing systems that produce such artifacts? Well, they, they, that, that was a long question and the answer should be much longer. I won't go into it, but I did. I just want to say that I had the pleasure of being on Chris Tote's orals on his dissertation committee and that's what led to Tableau and Pat Hanrahan is, has been was a collaborator and a friend for I mean, was a collaborator for many years and is still a friend. So I um, watched Tableau grow with pleasure. Um, so I I tried to give a bit of the semantics of the of the schematic forms of what lines mean and what dots mean and what boxes mean and how they get interpreted in visualization. So I think that's a partial answer perhaps to what you're asking. Um, and, but um, I'd probably have to go through specifics with you to, um, to be more helpful and to see the programs that you're struggling with. And yeah, the programs can be a problem. They don't always, as we all know, they don't necessarily do what we want them to do. And often they're in, incredibly complicated to decipher. But um, so I, I'm going to fail to answer your question in depth, but I'd be happy offline or online in some other way to have a longer discussion. Okay. Gail Curtis has a question that he wants to present. Hi, Gail. I don't Hi. know only your name, but it's nice to see you. 
Yes. Uh, am I on? Am I on? Oh, yes. Audio. Okay. So, Barbara, many years ago, it's like 20 years ago, I was working on a project of a wayfinding assistance system for visually impaired. Right. I remember. And, and I remember we had many, several conversations in your office, and you brought up the idea of, uh, you know, different cognitive styles. Some people like to have maps. I mean, I know, I mean, I'm that way. I just want to see how, you know, don't just tell me what to do. You know, show me a map. How, how are things related? But I know other people that will say, I get confused by maps. Just tell me where I have to turn, right? And I, and I remember that conversation. Yes, yeah, you know, it's not 80-20 or something, that, but it, there's different proportion of people tend to gravitate to a certain cognitive style. And it's not just that one is right and one is wrong. So I guess that's my question. Uh, okay. <laughs> I don't think we ever really quantified who likes what, but um, I think you're right. I mean, some, I mean, I know certainly from personal experience, but again, I don't think we've, we or anybody has quantified that. But yes, some people just want the roof. And when I turn, and some people are happy with the mat. I have a suspicion that many people can deal with both and can go back and forth. Um, it's the, I know maps for the blind are problematic. Uh, the, the tactile maps don't, your fingers don't pick up in the information in the same way that your eye does. Your eye is looking for lines and your fingers are looking for texture and temperature and not necessarily for lines. So tactile maps are a poor substitute, but um, many blind form maps in their head from navigation. And many of these people are better at wayfinding than, than sighted people because it's a spatial thing, not a visual. Mm -hmm. So I haven't quite answered your question, but. Yeah, um, well, John Carton has a, a question he wants to ask. Hi, I very much enjoyed your talk. Um, something that's always fascinated me is I, my experience of consciousness is that I think in sentences. Often I have dialogues with myself, but I gather that not everyone thinks that way and that there are some people think in very different ways. Um, and some autistic people, for example, claim to think visually. I've, I've heard it that dolph there's some theory that dolphins think visually. Um, do you have any evidence or, or, or knowledge in that area that you, that you could share about the, these I've always thought it was possible to think purely visually spatially instead of in this auditory kind of way. It might be more efficient in some ways. Do you have any evidence or knowledge about that? So it, I think it's more complicated. If you think about babies or animals um, who do very intelligent things but don't yet have language. So there's an awful lot of intelligent things that we can do. The basketball that I gave you, uh, I think you'd be hard put to, to th think that through in sentences when you're playing a fast moving sport. Um, so there, and it's probably more spatial. It's certainly visual too, because I, basketball, but it's a lot of spatial thinking. Where are people moving and what are people doing? But um, so it, it, Visual thinking, spatial thinking, thinking, responding to touch and movement, they're all parts of spatial, but different parts of it. So I mean, people like to dichotomize. It's either words, language, sentences, or spatial or visual, but I think it's, it's, it's more intricate and complicated than that. So it doesn't really a satisfactory answer, but I think it's probably closer to the truth. And uh, Madeline uh, Atkins had a, had a question that uh, maybe she wants to. Uh, I want to add one more thing to okay. that. Say you think in sentences, but where do the words come from? So it, it, it's the, the, the words that come to you are almost a consequence of the thinking. They aren't the thinking. So, Okay, and, and Madeline, now I'm ready for Madeline's question. Okay, yeah, hi. Um, I was fascinated by the videos of having the test takers read the text and the gestures they were making. And I'm thinking about um, 
deaf people who are fluent in sign languages such as ASL and how they use space in, in both in formal signs and in gestures, which are very complex and very systematic and linguistic, obviously. And um, I'm just imagining that would provide an interesting um, contrast with people who use spoken language and how the brain works. So have, has anybody looked into that? Oh, there, there are lots of people looking at the structure of, of um, signed languages. And um, I have a colleague at Teachers College who is Chinese and grew up with deaf parents. So she's fluent in Chinese sign, fluent in ASL, fluent in English, fluent. And it, she is very interested in teaching deaf. So as you notice, sign languages are completely grammatical. They have a complete grammar. And it, it, every th oh, most of what you see when you're watching sign language is language and has all the semantics and, and syntax of spoken languages. Apparently, and I'm not clear on this how, you can also gesture on top of it. So it, 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 signers can in addition gesture and they know when it's a gesture and when it's um, signed. Um, I've worked with Karen Emery, who's one of the main researchers of signed languages. And she has looked at how, how signed languages use space. And we've studied things like the, the map example that I gave at the beginning with uh, signers and with sighted people compared them um, and so forth. So it's, it's what you, your question it, it was, are people studying it? And, I, and the answer is yes. And it's extremely interesting work. So there's even work, a good friend and colleague of mine, Susan Goldenmeadow, and another woman who's a colleague at, um, at Columbia with me, Annie Sengas, have looked at, at cultures that have invented sign language. So they're called home signers. They, learned, they invented the language. The languages are different. Over generations, they become more grammatical. Um, Susan Goldenmeadow has some interesting findings that home signers who don't have a complete signed languages have trouble with certain concepts that, that signers with a complete sign language don't have trouble with. So there are, seem to be advantages to having a language. Um, so this is provocative research, but very interesting. And Maria wants to ask something about age and learning. Hi, yes. Um, I am wondering about if you have, uh, whether in the children and children or the very old, like looking at people with Alzheimer's and the like, if you have them, if you have them translating either from um, real life to diagram or diagram back to real life, let's say in exercises or whatever, does that create um, better learning for them or create more, um, more flexibility in their thinking? And I have a second question there too. The, the answer is I don't know. I know there have been attempts with people, aphasics who lose language to use kind of picture languages for them, develop them. There was, when we were first going to war in Afghanistan, there was a picture language that soldiers had where they actually had pictures so that if they ran into people whose language they didn't speak, they might use pictures to communicate. It is hard, I mean, and there were depicted languages. It is hard to get the fullness of a language in depictions. They quickly become schematized. And there are many concepts that are hard to depict and are depicted in, in different ways, similarly with sign and gestures. British sign language is very different from American sign language. Um, American Sign Language derived from French sign and the British developed on its own. So the fact that English is the background in both places has no relation to the signing. The sign languages are quite different. So it, I, I think to some, to some extent, some of the picture stuff helps aphasics. I don't know how much. 
but I know there have been many attempts to communicate with people um, who have trouble with language using depictions or diagrams of one sort or another. Thank you. I had one other quick question, which is how does emotion play into this in your sense? Well, I mean, we give away emotion in our faces and our bodies and our voices. So I, in the book, I do talk about emotion. And um, if you think about movement, the basic movement is to approach or avoid. And in some sense, they're emotions. I approach things that I like, that are attractive. I mean, it's about the world, and I avoid things that are repulsive. So I think emotion gets into motion quite quickly. However, I have no direct evidence for that. It's only linking it through behavior and through language, but no direct evidence. I mean, it almost seems obvious that things that we approach, we have good feelings about, unless we're forced to approach things that we don't want to, and then we show it. And things that we avoid, we have reasons for avoiding, and they're usually hooked up with emotion. So you, you could think of, and in, in, in situations where we have to act very quickly, is someone throwing a rock at us or is someone handing us something, um, then the emotional response is probably important um, that we want to avoid or approach. And so pro probably there are, my guess is, there, somebody's gonna look and find nice cortical connections between going forward and positive emotions, but I know of no work like that. Um, but it would be exciting to, to do it. Well, we have a, we have three or four more questions. Barbara, how are you holding up? I'm okay. Okay. So Lisa wants to ask another visually impaired question beyond the sign language one. Lisa, go ahead. I think she answered this, but um, but I'll ask it anyway. <laughs> uh, I I don't know whether I'm putting this in. I, I don't know whether this is explainable. Okay. What I was wondering is for a visually impaired person do they construct so somebody who has who was born visually impaired um do they construct uh, some sort of mental map or diagram and absolutely if, if so is it you know how would you characterize that is it in sound uh or please <laughs> it's spatial. um if you're driving on the highway i mean you're not you didn't come to bakai by driving but if you're driving on a highway and it's roads you know quite well, you have a temporal sense of where your exit is. And you know about that, how you've gone far enough and it's far enough. Those maps in rats are established by motion, the mental the maps in the cortex. So we know our way from the, the amount of time, from the effort, the body effort, and so forth. We know how far we've walked, how far we've driven, um, smells, sight. So it's spatial, not visual. And I know blind people who could navigate better than I can um, because they're, they're wind. Walking around New York as I am now, I was a longtime resident of the Bay Area. And usually this is the first summer I haven't been there ever. Oh, not ever, but in, in the last, um, since I moved to New York. So it, 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 it now I lost my thought. Um, but the, the general point is people know their way around from many different modalities and can keep track of them. I once had a, a student who was visually impaired. She couldn't see, she somehow could come to class and get the verbal things. She couldn't see diagrams. And I was teaching her a learning curve. And she came and asked me, what is that? So I took her hand and I made a vertical axis and I said, this is your score. And a horizontal one and said, this is time. So I said, this is time, this is, your, this is how, how well you're doing on the learning test. And then I took her hand and made a curve and she, a light bulb went off. She got it completely. 
It was spatial, not visual. So again, I think visually impaired people, um, I've seen them navigate better than I, and they know it through all these other modalities. They find their smells, um, wind. I know when I'm getting to certain streets in New York, I walk a lot. And I know when I'm getting to, I know when I get to a particular street, the wind is going to hit me <laughs> and I prepare myself for it. So we are not attuned to those other features. We probably use them implicitly, like the amount of time it takes you to get to your freeway exit. But um, if you're blind, that's what you have. Um, so Dave has, a, has an engineering question. I don't know how long we want to spend on that. I think he also mentioned that one of us can read the question for him. So well, he's here, maybe. Dave, can you can you read I it for yourself? Window. You have you have the stage if you want it, Dave. Anyway, he wants to know um, if a computer program has uh, will, will needs to uh, move in space to to understand the physical world. Ah, uh, that's interesting. Um, there are people now in AI who, who are claiming that um, that you really need to move in space in order to, and people working on robotics and looking at the way humans learn space and navigate space in order to make robots uh, work, understand that better. So yeah, I mean, a lot of the AI efforts have been about language and text, but robot is more about, I mean, there has been some effort in, in learning space and it would be hard to put all of that information that we have into a robot mind because we don't know it. But in, by the same token, it might be hard to give a robot enough of that information about moving in space for the robot to learn. So somebody in robotics can probably answer that better, but. My hunch is that an efficient way of, of getting a robot to be spatially competent would be to let the robot learn. Mm -hmm. So we have two last questions, both about diagramming. Uh, Brandon, do you want to go first here? Uh, sure. Uh, you sort of uh, suggested that uh, when we diagram <laughs> something that we um, we're externalizing gesture uh, and that that can be uh, better. But one disadvantage currently of diagrams is that they're static uh, and they, they contain all of the information from start to finish uh, at, at first sort of glance. Have you made any uh, study or have any observations about the progressive disclosure of uh, information in diagrams, sort of um, revealing information or, or observing a map being drawn versus seeing it sort of constructed as a whole? I haven't done direct studies on that. We did some direct study years ago on animations that are supposed to teach people physics or math or chemistry. And those are problematic because too much goes on at one time and people can't take them in. Um, but so our point really was that designing effective animations isn't as easy as you think. You can't just watch things in action. I mean, you think even about finding a route or telling someone a route, you don't draw it in real time, right? If you're going 400 miles on a freeway, that takes one, that explanation is very short. Um, it's when you make lots of turns that you get longer ones. Yeah. So going back to the reveal, I mean, the New York Times, other places, the journalists, data journalists, are doing really nice creative things, I think, with, with the success of Reveal or even with simple animations. I saw a very nice one the New York Times did on the, the sneezing um, and, and under masks or without masks in a subway, which is, of course, of concern to New Yorkers. Um, and, and so, and, and, and you, you might not get from that animation of the droplets of sneeze going everywhere exactly where it's going, but you got a feel for the volume, right? And, and the area, you got some, and the time course of the droplets from it. So you couldn't pick up exact information, but you got a feel. 
So I, th I do think the data journalists that are working in, in newspapers, uh, not just in the States, there are very good ones in, in the UK and, and Italy and other places. I've gone to a couple of meetings with them and been impressed, are doing a good job of figuring that out without experiments. I mean, it, it, you kind of check on each other. Are people getting it? Are people confused? You might hear from your readers. So I, you don't always have to do formal experiments um, on that. I only get upset when it, it, it's, you know, airplane signage is done by 25 year olds with good vision. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> so you talk about diagrams and visceral experiences like that. Uh, Julie, do you have a, a question that you want to uh, give? So, yeah, actually, when I was watching your experiments with people who were able to move and not move while reading, and you think about humans who are very visceral creatures, and I was wondering about the connection between the people who are able to move, well, people doing those experiments and their desire to, to turn the thing into a visceral experience and thus ending up moving. Yeah, so, yeah, I mean, visceral, you mean they're gesturing, they're doing more than I mean, they're representing what they're reading with their hands by making a model with their hands. They're representing it. It's, right. Yeah, and and um, and they're using their hands. You could use your body in other ways, but they are using their hands. Somebody years ago did an experiment on counting, so counting is really hard to do if you can't point. And so they tied people's hands, and the people count with their heads. And if you hold their heads stationary, they do it with their eyes. So it's hard to stop people from this simple act of counting without recording one and another one and another one. Um, so I mean, we did, the, there are individual differences all over. There were some people in throughout the many experiments that we've run that didn't gesture and got 100%. So, and there are people that gesture and didn't do so well. So there's, with any human behavior, there's a big range of possibilities, but um, letting people, letting people make models of the material when they're alone in a room um, is, it helps them. It's harder to do when you're in company, right? But um, that gets more complicated. But we do see people walking down the street, talking on the phone, gesturing like men. It's become normal. Yes. I so thank you so much for this wonderful talk, uh, Barbara. Um, and we've gotten a lot of people saying that they really like this. Um, and even, even the likes of Jock McKinley spoke up about that. So- uh, That's there. Yes, he is. He's, he's here. <laughs> um, yeah. yeah. Oh, he, he just put a lot of uh, smiley hands. Um, so um, we, we are very appreciative of you being here. You've had um, about 66 people at the height of the, of the talk. And I think everybody got something special from it. And I hope, he, can you hold up a copy of your book? I think people can think about getting out the... Uh, to go, I, well, I showed a picture of it at the beginning. I have to go to the next room. Is do you have patience? Uh, sure, we'll wait. Well, it's all right. People, people can okay. People I did people can find it. your book online. I'm sure it's yeah. a very exciting uh, topic, and I'm sure the book has a lot more than you can give in one hour talk. Um, so thank you, everybody, and I think that concludes our session this evening. Um, so thank you, everybody, for coming. And thank you for such being such a great audience and host. So, okay. Bye bye, everybody. See you again next month or even before. I'm looking at the chat. Yeah, the chat's kind of cool. Yeah, I couldn't look at it before. I know, you're pretty busy. <laughs> yeah. Are you having the egg? Uh, Oh, Larry. Barbara, I, we, we were going to have coffee together. <laughs> okay. You're having Larry Lifer too, I see. We... Yeah, well, that's, that's, that's right. And, and the question is, uh, do you have much to say about Fred Lakin?
Do you know, did you know him? I don't remember clearly enough, except that he was incredibly innovative. And, and, but I 